Hey, Shia. Thank you so much for meeting me today. I am super, super, super excited for this Q&A. Um, before we get started, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land. Although we are meeting on a virtual space, I want to acknowledge that the physical space I occupy belongs to the Darug people and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Aishia, I thought we could start with if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in climate change activism. Yes, so hi, I'm Aishia. I am almost 18, just a few weeks away from 18. I got involved in climate activism when I was um, the end of 2017, so I must have been around you know, 16-ish or 15, yeah. Um, and I got involved through grassroots activism. So I just went with a friend to like Parramatta one day when she was like volunteering for AYCC, which is the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, volunteering to um, take part in this activity called Paint the Town, where you know you chalk, it's not vandalism, but it's simple, <laughs> like innocent chalking um, in favour of like, you know, hopeful messages regarding the climate and putting up, um, you know, posters and whatnot. And I met some um, individuals at that uh, paint the town who, you know, I was very impressionable, impressionable, very young, very naive. And so upon discussing um, certain, like, you know, the realities of our nation and how we're contributing so exponentially to the degradation of the world climate, um, you know, upon realizing that I was kind of like, oh, okay, well, maybe I should have a role to play because these fellow youth slightly older than me but nonetheless young people these young people are very actively involved in this um, um anyways uh following like months of involvement with aycc uh, i think about a year later in um november uh in 2018 that's when the first strike took place with school strike for climate um that's when it formulated i was it, like involved in organizing um that strike and that's when i learned a lot of the well, that, I think that moment was very um, hopeful, so it was still very idealistic. It was very um, nice to see so many, like, the masses just on the streets. And, yeah, I, I remember that time being very um, lively, very enlightening. Yeah. And then moving forward, um, there was the uh, March, uh, March strike after that. Um, that's when I was a bit more heavily involved. You know, I emceed that, co emceed that strike. Um, organization was a lot more he like heavy duty because the numbers were just increasing by so much. For example, um, in November the previous year, I think 8,000 to 10,000 showed up in Sydney. But then when I was involved, like in March, it was about 30,000 30, plus. So, you know, it was kind of um, overwhelming and that's when the political kind of element entered like more uh, in a more dire way because we were entering that election period yeah. and you know with political implications came a lot of criticism like a lot more criticism than just oh young people oh, leaving school it, it was like proper you know you had to be legitimate and we were always legitimate but we just had to kind of gain that um, acclaim from the general public and I think that bit so yeah, just to summarize, like that was kind of my overall um, journey, how I went from just going on a little paint the town to being really involved on like the core team of organizing strikes. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and I can proudly say I was one of the 30,000 people there. <laughs> um, and I, I want to talk a little bit more about um, how you got involved in this because um, I, I remember reading an ABC article where you said that your activism is inspired by your city and your parents' home. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you can expand a little bit more on that and what you mean by that. In general, there are Australians. Australians do suffer to an extent from climate change and it is a worldwide issue. There's that thing to recognise that, and that's one thing that I had to kind of um, really taken through my like education over the years of like the detriments of climate change and second as I got more involved I realized that okay as kind of like a face of Western Sydney or whatever I um, and my fellow Western Sydney like ethnic uh, especially mostly women so like female um, fellow strikers we kind of uh, we have a more 
a bigger responsibility of sorts because the obviously climate change disproportionately affects um, communities, you know, in different ways. Low socioeconomic communities are uh, more susceptible to climate change. Western Sydney in general suffers from heat waves um, much more so than the rest of Sydney and various other metropolitan areas. Um, I, I know that in January of this year, I forgot which date, but um, Penrith was the hottest place on earth. Uh, yeah. yeah, so like um, that's just one kind of overwhelming figure, but mm -hmm. outstanding figure. But yeah, so um, the role that we have within, or that I had felt I had within my city to, you know, bring, and it's not just low socioeconomic area, like, you know, the, what I'm trying to say is that it's a social justice issue as much as it is a climate justice issue because of its disproportionate effects, because Western Sydney isn't just a locale, it's, you know, it has those socioeconomic implications, it has um, a majority migrant population, I'm sure, you know, people from Western Sydney know this, and um, yeah, so in general, that's kind of something that I came to realize and just became bitter about. So I felt that I needed to do something um, special, like through that lens. And then in terms of my parents' home, um, so my parents are from Bangladesh mm -hmm. and alongside the Pacific and some other like nations that are really susceptible to flood, like flash flooding and mm. um, just na natural like environmental catastrophes like so. Uh, kind of about to sink in a couple of decades if we don't do yeah. it, right so um that's alarming and even to like throughout my involvement I don't think I've understood how much of a how much more that me like you know the implications of that upon Australia's role as the on a macro level like it's our role as a western as a the most industrialized or the most advanced nation within this region of the world so I just was really disappointed with that whole, you know, I, I'm not expressing it well enough, but the point is that it made me really um, just more motivated, more upset, yeah. but also motivated about my particular role, my identity and um, how that should really motivate my ambitions within this space, within this climate space. So, yeah. Yeah. I totally get what you're saying. Like, I think um, it seems like, even climate change and activism and everything such a personal concept to you because you've built it around these values of Western Sydney where you're from and your parents home and back in Bangladesh and things like that and um, and I think the values are, are so integral to you which is why you're so passionate about this um, and I remember because I'm from Penrith so I actually very distinctly remember the the hottest day <laughs> because it was very hot and because there were so many people like in my from my high school and things like that who were posting on social media and saying talking about you know what is happening how are we the hottest place how is this the hottest place on earth <laughs> um and I just I want to talk about social media a little bit more in that sense um because I think with COVID and all of the pandemic um I think social media is kind of having an increasing role um and I want to know did social media play any sort of role when it came to organizing and campaigning for whether it was a school strike for climate action or any of the campaigns that you've done before? Well, to put it simply, social media is our, it's like the thing, the foundation of our activism, if you will. Mm -hmm. Obviously us being there on the streets, the striking itself is the activism. Mm -hmm. but in order to make that happen, it would just wouldn't happen without social media our main like driver has been social media our main tool has been social media for example um just to express not, not an, an example per se but um the all of our our network is only possible or it could only be built because of messenger right <laughs> yeah, to be honest and um yeah, when I was really like every day involved, Zoom, Messenger, Facebook, those three, and of course, like every other social media, like the circulation of information on the other apps. But you know, they, they that's how we communicated, that's yeah. how we, planned, that's how on a national level we could organize hundreds of thousands, and then on an international level, millions of people to strike. Um, yeah, that's just how it was, yeah. 
possible. I, I, I can't, um, there's no other way to say it except social media was the thing. <laughs> was the most important element of it. <laughs> um, that's, that's really, really cool to hear that. So I remember going to the School Strike for Climate Action in March and I remember coming home with this like huge sense of empowerment because I could see like physically see the people around me who were all protesting for the same thing all passionate about the same thing and it was just this like surreal feeling that I hadn't experienced before um and I know how you said social media is very important to the the planning and the whole school strike for climate action but do you think that kind of feeling that we've experienced by you know, getting out onto the streets and coming together as this huge thousands of people. Do you think that can be uh, replicated on social media, especially during a time where it's not as easy for us to, you know, go out on the streets and protest and things like that? Do you think a digital strike per se is possible? I think um, it definitely, the pandemic has kind of put a pause in everyone's lives in every respect. And so it's fair to say that it's nowhere like even if we no matter how much we try to replicate that feeling it just i don't think it can't be personally like in terms of the the empowerment as you said coming from that background that i explained as a young person you it's just so it's such a strong uplifting feeling to be surrounded by everyone and i I relate it to you um and relate to you entirely on that um note but um that doesn't mean that it's we can't have an impact because now everything has shifted. Well, not everything. Yeah. Most things have shifted online. So that's the playing field. Um, I think it's important to note that, uh, well, first of all, I'm not actively involved, like in this current um, point in time. I can imagine that, however, if I were like going at the pace that I was just a year ago, um, that this allows for a, a breathing, like a moment to breathe for a lot of the people who have been carrying on for like months and months um, campaigning and doing school at the same time and doing media um, appearances, etc. So that's a, a positive point. Yeah, it's important to kind of create, like take a moment for yourself and then mm-hmm. um, create a spirit of solidarity, which we've been see- seeing with other movements online, um, like Black Lives Matter most prominently. And digitally, yeah, that's the uplifting thing. And um, take, you know, now we have some more time to ourselves, or at least most people appear to. So it's time to educate oneself if they are not entirely um, versed with the many effects of climate change or our contributions to it. On that topic of uh, taking, like, that time to yourself um, during this time as well, um, I kind of want to touch on mental health and resilience on social media as well, because I think, like you said, it's so important for us to sometimes just take a step back and, um, you know, have a moment to breathe. Um, And sometimes even posting things on social media that are related to social justice and climate change or whatever it is, there's always this, um, I think with most of us, there's always this like voice in our heads that says, or what will people think about this? Or um, will there be criticisms on what we post and things like that? Um, And that can often really affect us and prevent us from uh, posting about these things that we're so passionate about. Um, And I'm curious to know, have you experienced criticism and negativity like that on social media? And if so, how have you responded to it? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> um, I think you would think that having been so vocal about my involvement being on like television, etc., where people can access, like my, they know that this is my identity or people that are close to me, they know that this is what I'm involved in and this is what I'm passionate about and what even having considered that like people still just, it's very easy for someone to, apparently for someone to berate you about a social justice issue about something that is, I don't know. I, I, they just want to get at you. But, you know, it's it's a frustrating thing. I, yeah, it applies to everyone. I think um, that feeling of insecurity or that um, voice in the in your head, like I, to this day, I'm always careful um, because on both sides of the coin, there's you know you a very 
there's a demand to be politically correct, which I respect, um, but, you know, it does make you very, you know, want to be very polished with everything you post. And then on the other hand, of course, there's the people who will take every chance they can get to poke holes at your argument. I think don't get caught up in sending, you know, engaging in incredibly long arguments with people online because sometimes they're just trolling you and it's difficult to recognize when, but um, it's once again, the, the mental health thing sometimes refer, it, be unapologetic. If you know that this is morally upright, which, you know, any environmental pro environment cause must be because it's about the betterment of human society and the world at large, how can it not be? And also just know when to turn it off the phone, <laughs> turn off the phone and just don't listen to the trolls. But yeah. Um, at the same, you know, I think that's also, it can be a, used in a positive way that trolling in that you can be more motivated personally to fill up any holes in your argument. Um, <laughs> as young people, we're here to, oh, as any kind of, as humans, we're just here to, if we don't have that power, if we don't have that um, academic background, if we don't have, uh, you know, those titles of legitimacy, then we're here to voice what we see, injustice that we see, um, damage that we see, and those in those positions of power are responsible to uphold or, like, you know, address out the issues that we've raised. Yeah, as simple as that. That was great. I'm going to end on that note because that was a great point to end on. Um, Aishia, thank you so, so much for coming today. I learned a lot and I'm sure the students in the C-Pod are really going to enjoy this interview as well. Thank you.